Thanks for coming out, everyone. Uh, as I said, my name's Tim Howell. I'm a senior product manager with uh, Red Hat and the Ansible team. And I have a long background with Ansible, so uh, I've, I've actually uh, started working with Ansible almost since it became a project, which means my use of Ansible actually, of course, predates uh, using, uh, uh, predates Ansible as a company, let alone an, a, a Red Hat product. Uh, so I've been working with the community. I was actually a customer for a while. I worked at Bank of America uh, and was Ansible's customer there. And then I joined Ansible as a consultant and a product manager. So my whole point here being I've seen it all from all sides of uh, how Ansible works. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, GitOps, uh, particularly the Ansible way. And I'll explain a lot more what's gone into my thinking and why I've uh, done uh, what, what I'm doing here. Uh, but quick show of hands, so I know, uh, I know we're at a developer conference. Uh, I just want to get an idea of my audience. Uh, who here uh, works with Ansible, knows Ansible? Perfect. OK, so, so the Ansible slides that I do have here, just in case, I promise to speed right past. Uh, I just put them in just in case. I do a lot of talking to people that aren't familiar with Ansible. I didn't think that'd be the case. Didn't want to presume. How many people, though, are working with uh, Ansible Tower or AWX, the open source? OK, so a lot less. So we'll do a little bit of explaining about that. Uh, Kubernetes? OK. Uh, operators? A few less? OK, last one, I promise. Who's familiar with GitOps? All right, great. That's fine. This is fine. I, I'm going to cover all this. I didn't want to cover anything that everyone here already knows. Uh, I was hoping people would know Ansible, though, that you were at an Ansible uh, presentation. Um, so let's start off with a little background on what is GitOps, what do they mean by GitOps, uh, and like so many terms in our, our space, in our industry, it's something that evolved and emerged, uh, and, it, and it really has come from the insights and the practices that came before it. And I found when I started looking at this and when I first started hearing about it myself that finding a true, uh, concise definition uh, you know, something definitive uh, is a bit elusive. Uh, it, I actually had to do a lot of reading and didn't really find uh, a great one. Uh, the whole idea of GitOps started in 2017, uh, and it was coined by a guy named Alexis Richardson. He's the CEO and founder of a company called We, uh, we Works. And um, a lot of how I define GitOps in this presentation comes from him and the work that WeWorks has done. So I just want to acknowledge them and that that's a really good place to read up on more of this stuff. It's the stuff that they've been writing. This here is the initial blog post that first explained the concept of, uh, of GitOps and put out some baseline ideas. Uh, it didn't provide the concise definition I was hoping for since this is the one everyone refers back to as being like this is what GitOps is all about. Um, but it is... Um, a, a, a good starting place. So depending on, uh, like I said, it puts out a baseline idea. It doesn't provide a, a concise definition. But uh, depending on who you ask, you'll get varying definitions of the terms that are out there. Uh, so anyway, this is a workflow that really began from Martin Fowler's uh, comprehensive you know, continuous integration thinking that went into it back in, I think it was 2006. And it really des descends from site reliability engineering, from DevOps culture, from infrastructure as code. What makes GitOps different is, well, it, it, it's part of that, and it descends from that. It's a very prescriptive workflow and a pipeline for how you develop things. So that's what makes GitOps what it is. It's that it's very prescriptive in what they mean and how it works. And this has all come from the wisdom and experience of people that have been trying to deploy these you know, hugely distributed systems and run it as quickly as possible uh, from dev all the way out to production in reliable ways and, and, and secure ways, uh, keeping systems stable, and doing this 30, 40, 50, even 100 times a day, pushing these type of changes. So that's the background um, on GitOps. What happened here? Okay. So in more of my reading, this is, the, this is the one that I came up with, which I thought really concisely, definitively explains what is GitOps. And it, GitOps works by using Git as a single source of truth for declarative infrastructure and applications. Uh, so the key points I have here, I bolded, which is that 
systems are declarative, that they use desired state in some way, shape, or form. So uh, we'll go into a little bit more about what we mean by that. Uh, that there's a single source of truth, that you don't have things spread all over the place, things in databases, things in your uh, code repositories, things in uh, run books, if you still do that, you know, manual instructions, things of that nature. And then the third is that Git is the UI. Git is how you do all your work, how you manage things, how you push things out to your systems. When, I've been re when I was reading up on this and seeing what everyone else is thinking about, when I was learning about it myself, uh, I did read other things that people have uh, put in there and that they include as part of GitOps. You'll hear a lot about immutable architectures uh, being a key part of NetOps, or sorry, GitOps, wrong, wrong talk. Uh, and even more specifically, uh, Kubernetes, very specific to Kubernetes. And that is what I'll demo, but I want to uh, expand that definition a little bit. Uh, spoiler there. Uh, so, like I said, this is, it's, it's a little, what I found is when you bring in immutability and, and Kubernetes, while they're really a good idea and there's definitely a place for them, I thought it was a little too prescriptive and too uh, limiting because uh, I really think that there are ways to use this workflow, to use these pipelines in ways that aren't strictly mutable and aren't strictly um, uh, in the Kubernetes space out there. So there are, there are, um, yeah, you know, like I said, they're really good ideas. They're strong preferences, but I don't, I don't feel that they're requirements. At least that's that's my theory on this. So some of the principles of GitOps, um, the entire system is described declaratively, and what that means is that instead of of giving a set of instructions, you're giving a set of facts. You're saying I want ten servers, or I, I need ten servers. Uh, you don't say, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I just uh, got that. You say there are 10 servers. You don't say, get me 10 servers. And what, so with the difference there is that you're stating, I need those 10, and the system figures out how to bring them up, or if you need the 10, or if you already have the 10, things of that nature. So that's you know, the, the, the difference here in what we're talking about, uh, systems being declarative. Uh, another way that people sometimes refer to declarative is it being desired state. I need 10 servers. That should be my state. If I don't have that state, get me there. Whether that's I need to scale down or scale up, that's up to um, the underlying system to uh, figure out. Uh, so that desired uh, state system is versioned in Git. All the workflows and all the tools and everything that you get out of Git with your code can be applied to your infrastructure, to your configuration, to these declarations. Um, and that these changes can be automatically approved to the system so that once you commit something to Git, there isn't a separate uh, uh, step that you as a developer need to take. This is at that point when the Git ops pipeline picks it up and gets it out and deployed from there. And another thing that, that, that um, they list out there as a principle is Git ops is that software agents ensure the correctness and alert on uh, divergence. Uh, I put the little asterisk in there because anyone that know, has, you know, we're all familiar with uh, Ansible know that we're kind of uh, against agents here. So uh, my interpretation of what is a software agent is a bit liberal in this one, and I'll explain that a little bit more. But this is the idea that, that like I said, once you make that commit, there is something that looks at what is in your single source of truth, your Git repo, and says, OK, what is, the, what is the actual state of my infrastructure right now? And then to uh, orchestrate getting it to, getting them to converge, getting them uh, to match at that point. So this is the typical uh, GitOps workflow that you'll see out there. Uh, it starts, like I say, with the developer doing their code and their CI. That continues, that that's pretty much stays the same. Uh, a key thing that, that, that they'll talk about uh, is keeping a separation from your CI CD. So there's, there's a lot of talk that that's a really good best practice is that to not use the same tool uh, pushing changes uh, out to production, for example, doing the deployment so, so that you keep that separation from all your testing in CI, uh, create images or uh, VMs or whatever it is and push it into a registry as part of one one step and then a separate process picks them up from the registry and deploys them, pulls them out into production, whatever that is. It could be an RPM package. Um, in my liberal definition, it could be uh, a container going out there 
uh, from um, Kubernetes. The other part is that we have a, um, you have a configuration repo, and that's where all your desired state sits of, hey, here, here's the state I want my infrastructure in, all the different feature switches and parameters and paths and certificates and secrets and things like that. Well, maybe not secrets in a Git repo. That is one of the areas that they um, do suggest possibly keeping things out of your Git repo is you don't want passwords and certificates sitting in there. Uh, but the idea there is that then the ops, people in ops, work with that Git repo to make changes and manage uh, the infrastructure through that Git repository. All right, so uh, the purpose of the presentation isn't to sell you on the merits of GitOps, uh, and it's really to show you, uh, you know, what is GitOps and how it can be applied uh, using, using Ansible, but these are some of the benefits that they list for why you'd want to use GitOps or what you get out of practicing GitOps. Hmm. Almost just poured uh, water on myself here. That would have been really cool. Um, no, I don't have a drinking problem. <laughs> These are some strange caps. All right. Um, so, where was I? Okay. So the idea is, uh, you know, you get this increased productivity of being able to uh, push changes, uh, you know, 30, 40, 100 times a day. This was part of the thinking that went into why to do GitOps. We hear, you know, of it a, uh, a lot in uh, code as, uh, as inf uh, infrastructure as code and things like that. That is also part of what they were trying to do with GitOps. Uh, you get the enhanced developer experience of, of all, the, all the workflow, all the audits, the checks, the, the, the code reviews and, and everything that goes on there that leads to better stability and reliability. The separation of CI and CD uh, is, is part of it. The ability to have, uh, to be able to uh, reverse changes, to have that audit log that if something bad goes out or something adversely in fact, uh, affects your infrastructure, you can revert that change and go back to the previous stable state. All those things that we get out of code, you can now apply um, to your infrastructure itself using these GitOps principles. Okay, so that was the, that was the whole uh, GitOps thing. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Ansible, we were, we, why we're here, I guess. Uh, so uh, as I've been saying, when I first started hearing about GitOps, I was going, I go to KubeCon and everyone's talking about GitOps there. And uh, so I've been hearing about that a lot and it, and it got me thinking, well, what would GitOps the Ansible way uh, look like? Was this even uh, possible? Uh, was this even a good idea? So it led me to build this proof of concept to just see, you know, how, 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 would, how would this look? You know, I'm an Ansible guy, I've, you know, have my clear biases. Uh, let me see what, what this would look like if I went ahead and did that. So like I said, a quick review of Ansible when I talk about the Ansible way. Uh, you know, what, what do we mean? Uh, you know, Ansible's based on the whole simple, powerful, agentless idea, uh, and uh, the key parts of it being, you know, human readable and uh, uh, no coding skills needed is what really is declarative, and when we talk about desired state, that's where that comes from, from the whole Ansible philosophy. Uh, Ansible, we, we talk about, usually when we say Ansible, we're referring to the engine. I'm gonna be showing some stuff that relies on Ansible Tower, it's the only reason I'm showing you this. Uh, and Tower sits on top of Engine, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, has a whole lot of functionality for doing things at scale in an organization. Uh, that's the key part that you need to know about that, like I said, I'm not here to do a sales pitch. Uh, AWX is the uh, upstream open source version of Tower. Tower is the product that Red Hat sells and helps us uh, pay pay the bills, uh, but AWX is the open source project that, that is turned into Ansible Tower, or primarily turned into Ansible Tower. Um, so if, uh, this is where all of our developers are actually working day to day, uh, getting things done, pushing out uh, you, you know, fixes and, and new features before it gets turned into Tower. Uh, just a little bit, just really fast, so some of the high level features, the key one uh, you know, is, is the RESTful API here that Tower runs as a, as a server, brings a whole lot of other functionality. Like I said, I'm not here to pitch this, I'm just quickly giving you an idea so you, for those of you who aren't familiar, know 
uh, and can follow along with what I'm doing. Uh, one key part of Tower uh, concept that if you're not familiar with Tower or AWX and have been using Ansible is this concept of a job template. And this is where all the different parts get pulled together. Your inventory, your credentials, uh, your playbook, your roles, uh, all those different command line settings you would normally run in an Ansible engine gets put into what's called a job template. Um, so again, this is just some really quick background so you can follow along with the rest of, of what I'm going to talk about here. Um, I'm actually uh, moving along faster than I thought it would be. OK. This is a typical uh, Git-centric Ansible deployment uh, workflow that we see here. So this is similar to what we saw in GitOps, which is partially why when I first saw GitOps and I saw a similar diagram, I kind of said to myself, oh, this kind of looks like Ansible workflows that we see out there. Uh, the one thing that we see today, though, is that we see a lot of people using a CI. Typically, it's Jenkins. And uh, uh, I saw this when I first came in as a consultant and helping our customers there, is that they would deploy Jenkins strictly to watch a Git repo. And then when a change happened in that Git repo, launch an Ansible job. And that was the sole reason they were running Jenkins at the time. Uh, uh, in, in a lot of ways. They would use other things for CI, or they would have a separate Jenkins system uh, running out there um, just to do that one thing. So uh, that was an interesting thing that we noticed and saw happening en masse with, within our, our user base in there. Uh, and then they had, of course, the operations people that would work directly with Ansible Engine or Ansible Tower, AWX, whatever they're using there to push things out to the cloud networks, whatever they had in there. So more recently, uh, I think it was last fall, shortly after Ansible Fest, uh, we launched uh, it's Ansible Tower 3.6. I believe this came in around AWX 9.0, uh, from the best I can tell from the change logs. And we added uh, these automation webhooks. And the whole idea there is that now you could link up uh, your automation inside of, uh, and, uh, inside of Tower AWX to do things like uh, project updates or update inventories or perform deployments uh, when a change happens on a given uh, repository using a webhook. Uh, right now, we're, this supports uh, GitHub, both private and enterprise, and also uh, GitLab out there. And there's plans to add more of that. But this is the initial. Uh, feature that we added, partially from what we were seeing here, we said, you know, maybe we need to get rid of one extra piece here. So we went ahead and did that. Um, so now what happens today uh, with these new capabilities is that you can re remove uh, the need for a dedicated CI just to trigger, you know, catch changes happening in a given repository and then tell uh, Ansible to uh, run, do a deployment or whatever it is that you need to do. All right, so I, I talked about there was a reason you needed to understand what um, job templates were. And this would be the reason you uh, configure your uh, webhook within the job template. Here under options now, there's a, um, a, a little webhook uh, option that you, you click. And at that point, it opens up this bottom half of, uh, of, of options where you can pick or more options, I guess, details, configurations of the webhook that's going to be associated to a given job template. You can pick you know, GitHub, GitLab, and then at that point, the system will generate a, a unique webhook URL for you for this system that you're running. And then you can, um, it will also generate the, the token that you can put into your GitHub uh, account or your GitLab account in order for it to fire the, the webhook. It's pretty nice uh, when, when I was using it. Once you put all this in, um, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And you go over to GitHub, for example, they have a nice little test button. And you can see you know, that everything's now wired up and working. So it's a, it's a really pretty straightforward process. OK. So that laid out how you would do these things, how you would um, use Ansible in uh, a Git-centric uh, workflow. 
question is now is what, what are the advantages here of using Ansible, at least how I see them. Like I said, I already told you I'm biased. Uh, but uh, for the sake of, of argument of what, what do I mean by, by you know, GitOps in the Ansible way, uh, is that you have these declarative state definitions like Kubernetes. So you know, Ansible is a declarative state, desired state engine, um, um, it works declaratively. This is very similar to Kubernetes, and we saw that you know, a lot of definitions of GitOps say this is, uh, is something that Kubernetes, uh, you know, why you should use Kubernetes or GitOps is only specific to Kubernetes. Uh, you can also do that with Ansible. Uh, the other thing that I thought was a really great advantage to, to this and where it broadened my definition of GitOps with the biases that I have is that Ansible can support not only cloud native uh, like Kubernetes, but also traditional IT automation and do that in a declarative way. So it, it made me say, well, why does it have to be immutable and Kubernetes only? Uh, if you apply Ansible, you get declarative state and hey, look, I can manage my network and hey, I can manage my, my uh, more traditional cloud provider VMs, both public and private, things like that. So it gives you that flexibility and that freedom to choose uh, what tools you want to use and also what you're going to apply GitOps to. That GitOps isn't uh, necessarily only tied to uh, cloud native and Kubernetes and that sort of stuff. So uh, like I said, there's, there are integrations beyond Kubernetes. And uh, it's, it's the same tooling. Uh, if, if you're already using Ansible, great. Now you don't have to learn something new. Uh, you, can, you can leverage all that stuff you already know and uh, what you've already been doing out there. So when it comes to GitOps, then this is what I mean by uh, GitOps done the Ansible way. Uh, the, the first part, the CI, the, you know, uh, that still remains the same, still kind of works the way you're used to working with it there. Where it changes and, and, and where a lot of the focus of GitOps is on the delivery part, which is on the right side of the screen there, so that once you have these artifacts ready, whatever they are, like I said, they, they, they can be RPMs, they, they can be Python packages or jars, wars, um, things of that nature are, are ready, uh, you can then apply these features that you find in Ansible Tower in order to create a GitOps pipeline so that when these uh, when you make changes down in your configuration repo, when you say, I'm updating this WAR file, or I'm updating this image, or, oh, we're, we're, um, it's the holidays and I need more capacity, so I'm going to up the, the, the pool of cache servers or, or database nodes or webs, whatever it is, you're making those changes, and at that point, Ansible can pick that up and, and handle the process of going out there and deploying to your infrastructure what you need. So the one thing, there, there are a couple things of note here that are a little bit different than GitOps. As I said in an earlier slide that I had a uh, agent with uh, stars next to it. In this case here, Ansible's working as the agent. In a number of the specific deployments that I saw out there, they used a uh, dedicated Kubernetes operator that you put on your cluster itself that did the work of pulling from your repository and then seeing what the state of your Kubernetes um, cluster is and what is in this, uh, uh, what's in Git, and then to resolve the two. In this case, Ansible's taking that over. So essentially, we're providing uh, uh, agentless way to Git ops is the way that I was looking at it, because now you don't have to install this dedicated operator. You can have Ansible sitting outside of whatever platform it is that you're managing and it can do all of that for you. So that's one of the things, and that's why I put the, the stars in, uh, next to the, the use of software agent, and that's my liberal interpretation of operators, or I'm sorry, of, um, of these agents, which typically end up being operators. And it's operators like Weaveworks has Flux, if you're uh, into that thing. There's also one that has been making the rounds within uh, different Red Hat events. I think it said Unomia. Um, E-U-N-O-M-I-A. Um, so I've seen other ones out there uh, like that. Um, another thing that's interesting is that uh, you have a bit more flexibility with uh, push-pull workflow here. In the past, this has just been uh, pull. 
the, the, the way GitOps works is that you'll see this, these agents that are out there and pull everything in. With Ansible, you have a little bit, it's a, there's a little bit of push to it. There's also a lot of pull, um, uh, especially if you're working with operators here. And that's uh, what I'm going to be doing in the demo that's coming up here. So I think I said enough about this slide. So yeah, so what I'm going to demo here, uh, I'm silly enough to try a live demo uh, being jet lagged, uh, uh, that I'm going to be focused on this part here that I have circled in red. I'm not going to show the whole CI part, because that's, like I said, pretty much what we all are used to doing and using. The only, like I said, the only thing that's maybe a little bit different is that you, you push something in your CI to that registry and that, that's a, that there's kind of a wall there uh, from what tools you're using um, in that regard. So uh, let me switch over here. Oh, right. No. Oh, man, I lost my, uh... there it went. OK, great. So, um, of course, I got logged out of here. <coughs> so, what I did was I tried to build a basic demo of uh, what. Um, what this thing would look like, the, what the, the, the desktop, I'm sorry, the desktop, I'm looking at the dashboard and saying desktop, uh, of what Ansible in a GitOps workflow would look like. So this is what I came up with. Uh, so I have, didn't think ahead, and I built this all out in the state. So fingers crossed that this isn't uh, too slow going all the way back, uh, back over is, um, so I just have, All right, so, so this here is my uh, Kubernetes cluster I have running. What I did ahead of time is I'm using an operator for uh, something called uh, McRouter. So this is for a system that is a uh, dynamic caching system out there that you have uh, at the front of it. You have, I should actually use this diagram. Sorry. Sorry, I have a better diagram for this that I'm going to. All right, so what I'm showing, so, so what this app does is it's for uh, deploying and managing a scalable caching service, and there's two components to it. It's one part is using memcache. Memcache has been around a long time, general purpose caching system, uh, but it's, it's highly capable, but it's sort of dumb in that it's just a single node. Uh, it doesn't know about other nodes. It can't do sophisticated things like replication and clustering and failover and things like that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty rudimentary caching system, but widely used. There's this other thing uh, out there that uh, Facebook actually created. Facebook's actually a major user of memcache. Uh, I was actually involved in the memcache community like 15 years ago. I remember when some of the engineers first showed up there, we were like, wow, this new startup Facebook is using memcache, it's cool. Um, they built this thing called McRouter, and it's a memcache protocol router that sits in front of a pool of these sort of dumb memcache nodes and provides all sorts of advanced functionality, connection pooling, flexible routing, replication pools, and a whole bunch of things like that. So uh, the way it works then is that if you're running this in Kubernetes and you have all these different um, different nodes out there that uh, uh, McRouter needs to know what's in its pool so that as you have scaling events and you know, one goes away or some more come online, you have to keep updating McRouter. So that's what the operator is doing. It's watching the state of that memcache pool, and then as things come in and out, it updates the operator automatically. So it's monitoring what's happening on the Kubernetes cluster itself and doing that, um, doing that work out there. So I already deployed all that ahead of time, so you won't have to sit through this uh, there. Uh, but what I did then is, uh, so what we have, actually, let me show you this here. So this is all my automation that's out there. I have, um, 
cube, cube control configuration file, and then I have a <coughs> playbook, which lets me update what's going on here. Uh, the key part is that bottom one there, uh, the, the Kates module that lets me talk to the Kates API cluster and tell it, you know, here's my definition file of what I want to do. So it's talking to the operator itself to say, I need, um, I need certain state from here, uh, or here's the state that I want this uh, resource to be in. And this is the template that it uses. That's one of the advantages of using Ansible, and why I'm, I'm already spoiling my talk tomorrow, um, is that we have that whole templating system so you can template your definitions and make them repeatable. So this is a whole bunch of uh, what gets fed into it. And then uh, what I have here is a configuration. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. So I want to have three. So I'm just going to run this as, well, actually, that's not going to show you much. Uh, get me out of there. All right. So let's say five. We're going to go big. All right. So in the Git ops, so I've made my change. I want five of these out there. I will add that now. Nice commit message. All right, now before I do the push, so this is only on here locally right now, I wanna go over here. Just so I can show you it working. Now typically, one of, one of the advantages of this is that you never have to go into Tower itself. Once you have all this stuff set up, you can be just making commits to Git and then watching your observability and monitoring tools to see what's happening. Uh, maybe not even look at all, leave it to the ops people out there. Uh, but I'm just to show you it working here. Uh, we'll go out there. I'll pull this up here. All right, so. And I also didn't get enough caffeine today, so I'm really dragging. All right, so I'm going to push this now up to my repo and head over here and give it a second. All right, Towers picked it up there, it's working. Slow, but it's going. All right, we see there now it's the Configure Kate's cache service job is running after it did a uh, 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 SCM update. That's something I forced just to make sure things worked. All right, so that ran successfully. Here we see that everything ran, looked good. And if I go back over here, oh, like I said, this is going all the way back. We now see that it's deployed five memcache nodes just by me making that one change inside of Git and then Ansible passing it all the way through. Uh, in, in this case, like I said, we're using an operator. Uh, I've been working a lot also on Kubernetes stuff in the Ansible Kubernetes story integration. So uh, I have a colleague that's looking at uh, net networks so that you could be updating your network configuration and it getting pushed out to all your physical networking gear uh, the same way here. So, so there you go. That was, that's the demo. Uh, I guess I could make I have time to change one more, scale it down to show that I not fake in this. We'll go to three. All right, give that a second to run. We won't even look in, um, let 
Yep. Needs a few more seconds. OK, we see now it's starting to work. We see pods now are, so I went from five to three, and we see that it's in the process of, of uh, tearing those down. So let's see if by now we should, yeah, so four already died, three's terminating, things like that. So that's uh, proof this isn't all smoke and mirrors. Crazy American and his lying president is not the, <laughs> hasn't been affected by him at least. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so that, that's the main gist of, of GitOps, the Ansible way. Uh, there is more, though. So I just wanted to just take a couple more minutes here to, um, I should bring this back up. Yeah, so uh, I believe it's still, yes, I'm still good on time, plenty of time. Uh, th there's more that you can do with this, expanding out this idea. Like I said, I just want to do a basic demo, a basic proof of concept of how this would work. Um, it's not just uh, uh, job templates and single uh, um, automation jobs here. You can actually apply this to workflows. Workflows also have the ability to do a webhook, and what a work flow lets you do is wire together multiple job templates for people that aren't familiar with Tower AWX and add some logic to it if it fails, if it passes, things like that. Uh, that's what's pictured on the left-hand side here. Uh, part of this in, in automating and using uh, Ansible is that you can do multi-cluster deployments and management. So you, you can have repeatable ways of rolling things out uh, to uh, Kubernetes or, or other systems. Uh, by using Ansible because of the templating and things like that you, you can do uh, using things like inventory hosts or groups. So I could roll out different sizes of the pools or different versions of the uh, memcache image that I'm using based on maybe what part of the world it's getting pushed to or things of that nature. Uh, you can take advantage of all the other things that come along with uh, Tower and AWX out of the box, the ability to do uh, streaming of logs to Splunk or Elastic, um, the ability to send out notifications to IRC when these jobs run, things like that. Um, and you also have the ability to do some things that are, I'll call git opish, that, that maybe break from the, the traditional definition. Uh, for example, like adding approval steps along the way where something maybe um, gets pushed out to dev or test, and someone has to go in and say, yeah, this looks good, and push it along. Um, I know probably a lot of us aren't into that, but I used to work for a major bank, and they're kind of paranoid, and they like their checks and balances, and so, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll allow them to do that here uh, with, with GitOps um, sort of thing. Um, so now, in, to be open and transparent, there were some areas that I hit that were a little rough, and that there was some room for improvement. Uh, the one that I ran into, and I'm still not sure I figured out the, the best approach to, is was the handling of Kubernetes credentials and secrets, uh, particularly in how it's integrated into Tower. Uh, I had actually a talk with one of my colleagues, and there's now a, uh, a feature request ticket that I have up there that's uh, tracking this in the AWX uh, project. Uh, but the whole idea that I had a cube control file and uh, do I put that in Git? And then if I do put it in Git, now I have these secrets that someone can control Kubernetes with. So I had to use Vault to make sure that only people that need to use that or uh, can use that. And then, you know, does it even, maybe, maybe that's something that best practice says, well, that should be in a secret store somewhere or in the tower credentials, in which case there isn't something built in today to do that. Uh, another thing I ran into is native support of the Kates module. Uh, could be a little bit better. I had to install external libraries into Tower and AWX itself in order to get this to work. I really wish and hope that those would be included with Tower itself. We do it for all the major cloud providers. Why not Kubernetes? Pretty optimistic that'll change eventually also. Uh, the Kates modules, the, the, the underlying ones, I only use the, the Kates one, but there are some others. Uh, they could be a little bit better. They were mostly developed by the community and some other, uh, some Red Hat engineers at OpenShift. Uh, if anyone has any ideas, a pull requests are accepted on, uh, for all of this, actually, but particularly in that area. 
And then the other thing that came to me is I looked at other tools that are out there in this space, like Argo CD. I know that's being talked about very shortly. Um, you know, Tower is a generalized automation UI, so I knew I had to figure out where to put things, which isn't very hard, but there isn't, it isn't as uh, straightforward if you're doing this with Kubernetes, where if you're using something like Argo that is specifically made for doing Git ops and continuous deployment in the uh, Kubernetes space. All right, so uh, wrapping up here, as I mentioned, I'm, I actually have one more talk uh, happening tomorrow if you're interested more uh, about Ansible Engine and how to use it with Kubernetes. I'll be doing a short talk tomorrow, um, different room uh, at 3 o'clock, so please stop on by if I didn't uh, totally uh, bore you and offend you uh, in today's talk. Uh, there's uh, a few links up here for reading up more on GitOps. There's a lot of it out there. I found the best stuff is actually with we, uh, Weaveworks, uh, which, you know, hey, they, they, they kind of coined the term and developed the idea, so it doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Uh, there are uh, articles out there uh, uh, under the OpenShift team. There's a really good introduction to GitOps with OpenShift. Uh, they're, they're using Argo CD for their CD part of it and a, um, uh, an agent. Uh, as an operator act, uh, out there. Uh, there's a mention of the Cates module, and there's a really good article that was written by a guy named Jeff Geerling recently on the Ansible blog uh, that talks about the different ways that you can use Ansible with cloud native and Kubernetes, which also, like I said, pours into tomorrow's talk that I'll be giving. And um, I believe with that, that's all I have. Is there any questions? Did I... Did I lose anyone? Yes. Yeah, so there, okay, so the question is, uh, how, how would I test uh, the manifests of like... Uh, uh, right, right. There's a couple different ways. I mean, you well, first of all, that could be in your CI chain, that it, that it happens uh, over there. Uh, but uh, on the configuration side, I could see you putting in something that doesn't work at that point. And that's an area that an, where the operator itself could help, because, because when you would feed in the spec to your, um, to your custom resource, you would get an error back from Kubernetes saying that this is something that, that CR doesn't understand or doesn't know how to work with, and then the operator would stop it from propagating out to the actual application. So you would, in that case, that, that API would kind of give you an error message and you, you would know I have a problem. But you could also put a task in your automation. We have like assert modules, uh, for example, that you could actually do some validation of that file going in at that point. So it depends how you like to work. <laughs> there are some tools out there that I, I heard about, I didn't get to actually try themselves that are supposed to do that also. Um, I'm forgetting the name of them, but I saw some tools for validating uh, your, your YAML before it goes into Kubernetes. So if you have a spec for here's, this needs to be an integer, this needs to be required, this has to be between this range, this could check that. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't. Yeah, I'm sure the OpenShift team's so big, and there are so many people doing work. I would no doubt someone's out there working on this. So, any other questions? Yes. Uh, yes, you could. You could do that. Uh, there, that is an area that uh, I probably should have put that up there. Is another thing that you could do better. There is a way to pull out a Git. Um, I'm sorry, to pull out a job template and put it into Git and then reverse it. Uh, but it's a little um, clunky, I guess would be the word for that. Um, that is another good point I should add to this. Yes. Yeah, I had to, I had to set up my job template by clicking around. And yeah, you're right. That, uh, that would be nice if we could put that in Git itself. There is work being done on modules inside of Ansible for talking to Tower itself. Oh, okay. All right, great. So, uh, 
so that, that'll, that'll provide a path to making that easier and more straightforward. But yeah, that, that should be another, uh, another point on my, that last slide I showed. Any other questions? Okay, well, I will be around the rest of the conference. Please feel free to say hello or uh, uh, don't be shy. Talk to me. I have uh, some Ansible swag, our mascot for uh, operators with Ansible, the operable, if anyone wants any. Uh, I got them here. Stop on by. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks. Thanks.